The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ reframes everything, bringing hope, life, and meaning to every part of human culture. And yet many of us can't see how our faith shapes much of everyday life and experience. Sunday to Sunday, the in-between days, where was Jesus? I didn't think about the whole of who I am. What was I passionate about or how God uniquely made me? What are God's purposes for us? What does it mean to be made in the image of God? How do we live in the world, but not of the world? God wants to make us more ourselves. He is holding all things together and that he is reconciling all things to himself. We're exploring how does the biblical story reframe our story? We live out of our stories. So be located in the story, the biblical story in which God reveals himself, his character and his life. I've always loved the Emmaus Road story, that you've got these dejected, dispirited disciples, you know, crawling home after seeing the end of all their dreams. And suddenly, their eyes are open to see that what they thought was failure and weakness, that, that God had abandoned them, that all their dreams were nothing, that God was still in control, that he was the, still the king of the universe, that all the promises of, of the Old Testament hadn't been squashed because Jesus was dead on a cross, but were actually living and alive and active, and that God was restoring and redeeming the whole universe. And this event that they'd witnessed was the turning point of all of it. Suddenly they're running back into town and they're bursting with joy, and that's where the explosion of the gospel came throughout all the world. Like the disciples on the Emmaus Road, throughout this course, we've been on a journey. We've been asking the question, if Jesus is the redeemer of all things, how does faith reframe every aspect of our lives? I know that I'm drawn to this Christian story, this Christian vision of reality, because I think it actually is reality with a capital R. It's really the way to make sense of life. It's a story not just about us, but about the cosmos, the heavens and the earth. It's a story about life, the universe, and everything. We're meant to act. We're meant to create. We're culture makers. Through our art, through our science, through our technology, through what we make, we can take creation and not diminish it, but, but uh, appreciate it, give, us, give it a voice lift it back up to God. Certainly moral evil has entered the world and certainly evil has damaged the world. But biblical faith never gives up on the belief that the good creator who designed this good world is still involved in blessing it. Whatever may be our biological family history, whether we remember much about it or not, we have a spiritual family history that involves God's mission to redeem and repair a broken world. Israel um, has so many faults in, in one level. Right? I mean, the, the entire history that you see is this repeated rebellion against God, um, and yet God remains among them. God moves his story along by calling people, often very ordinary people, to trust him and obey him. The Gospels very clearly reveal Jesus to us as the fulfillment of all of Israel's hope, taking it back to the kingship of David to show Jesus as the true king of Israel. Anybody connected to Jesus 
is connected to salvation because he's the Savior. But he's more than a Savior. He's the Messiah. The implications of this are astonishing. They're amazing, astounding, gobsmacking even. So Jesus is the king and he is creating a new world order in which he is the ruler. The call of the gospel and the claims of God and of the Lordship of Christ in our lives has to do with all of who we are. Behold, 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 the dwelling of God is with humanity. We are going nowhere. Heaven and God, it seems, are coming here. And the fact that the whole biblical narrative starts with two chapters on creation, the goodness of creation, and ends with two chapters on the goodness of creation ought to be a giveaway that the stuff in between means that we live in this world as God's world, hopeful of the renewal of creation, but caring for it as best we can. God has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. It is not enough to have a reframed understanding of the biblical story. We must be pulled through the frame and into the story, left breathless from our encounter with a living God. That's the great promise. Our sins having been forgiven, we are set free from the past and with his spirit now in us, transformed, ready to live into the future. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? I wanted us to once again address this road to Emmaus. And we're going to see and think about what do we take home with us from all of this. Kind of like the two on that road, I've spent a lot of my own Christian experience sort of sadly looking at Jesus and saying, don't you know? Don't you know what has gone on in my world? I mean, think about it. In this passage, it's, it's really kind of funny. It says Cleopas and the other disciple. Now, th that would be my luck to finally get into a biblical story and be called the other disciple for over 2,000 years. <laughs> Cleopas and the other disciple. It was Cleopas that looked, to him, looked at him and said, Are you the only one that doesn't know what's gone on in Jerusalem? Now, that's interesting. Asking Jesus Christ if he knew what had just happened in Jerusalem. I think it's funny, actually, but anyway. Ironically, they thought that they needed to open his eyes when, in fact, he very desperately wanted and needed to open theirs. We're like that, aren't we? We need to encounter Jesus, or more truly, we need him to encounter us, and he desperately wants to. We're hoping that that's exactly what this course is doing for us. The reframing of the Christian story so that our eyes are opened to seeing Jesus more clearly in all the events of our lives. The reframing of our own story so that we see it as a part of God's huge, big story of redemption as laid out in Scripture. That's why the road to Emmaus is such a good picture of discovery. First, Jesus encountered them. They were confused, they were distressed, but he encountered them. Second, Jesus reframed their understanding of who he was by explaining the story. On the road, it says Jesus explained, starting with Moses and the prophets, all that Scripture said concerning him, or showing that everything in Scripture concerned him. Jesus 
took, now think about this, Jesus took the God-breathed words of man to explain himself. But he could have just said, it's me, I'm God, or here's some new words of God. No, he pointed back to scripture, to the story. And as we've heard several times today, their hearts burned within them as he verbally took them through the scriptures in their head. Now, I don't know about you, but my picture of the road to Emmaus is like Jesus with his Bible open, pointing to the story, right? I don't know what I thought that would be, like the zero century Bible translation. I mean, he didn't do it that way, did he? He had it in his head. They had it in their heads. And he took them through mentally. They didn't even have the text on their smartphones. They were excited. But it wasn't until he went and did the simple task, the simple human task of eating, that their eyes were open to who he was. And then we see their response. It was joy and celebration. A perfect, beautiful response. And then he disappeared. They had made that seven-mile journey from Jerusalem that day, from Jerusalem down to Emmaus, because Jerusalem, you always go up, right? But all of a sudden, that didn't matter anymore. They got up after dinner, made that seven-mile journey up this time back to Jerusalem in order to tell his followers. They were so excited. Now, I've often thought I would like to have been there. I would like to have heard that Bible study with Jesus. I just would. And it's one of the scenes that I I have thought in my mind, when I die, if we can replay scenes of history, that's one I want to listen in on. And I've often thought what that might feel like to actually hear all that and start to put all that together. But I'd never thought until I started preparing this talk for you guys What did it feel like to Jesus? What was it like to finally be able to show them who he was? What all this Messiah stuff was about? The road to Emmaus was his first go at it, resurrected. (laughs) What did that feel like? In chapter 22, Luke describes for us a bit of what Jesus was feeling earlier that week before he was crucified. He writes that at the Last Supper, Jesus said, I have eagerly desired to eat this meal with you. Now, in Greek, this really stands out. We don't have a way of saying this in English. We we say eagerly desired or I've really desired. But in Greek, they can pile up the same word and they can say, With desire, I have desired. And that's what Jesus did. With desire, deep, deep within me, I am desiring to eat this Passover, to get this week started, to make it to where you can enter my joy. In John, it tells us that his focus was that they would enter his complete Joy. When Jesus prays that high priestly prayer in John 17, verse 13 of that chapter tells us that he was excited about the redemption that this would bring. It says that they might enter into my complete joy. He knew it would steal them from the hopelessness that those two were feeling on the road. Jesus knew that once they saw who he was, their understanding of being truly human would be explained. Being always precedes doing. From that, they would know what to do in their world. And sure enough, they run with that message filled with joy. That's what Jesus is about, isn't he? Placing himself as our resource. All of Scripture speaks of him, God's agent of redemption, filling us with his spirit, as Bruce reminded us, how important is that, to be his redeemed ambassadors here on earth, 
retelling and reframing who Jesus is for our world, not changing who Jesus is for our world, but showing them the true frame, the one that is found in Scripture. Until we understand who he is as redeemer of a whole lot more than just our personal sin, that's big. But it's bigger than that. And until we learn that, we can't quite understand our role as his ambassadors of redemption. Sometimes we think that that role is one of stressful labor on our own. I think I was living in that place about 20 years ago. Phil and I were in a very hectic phase of life. We had four children in the home, and that should say enough. (laughs) Um, Phil was teaching an overload of classes, an overload of students. I was teaching weekly at church and heading up a retreat, and I was also going to seminary. I was a Greek student. And one evening, I went to class, and the professor said, let's just pray for each other before we start. There are only four of us in this class. And so I thought, oh, yes, please. And so he said, what are your prayer requests? And of course, mine was for all this stress, for all this busyness. And honestly, I think there was underlying in my heart a little bit of, in this godly? See how hard I'm working for Jesus? I don't think I would have ever admitted that. Um, But I think it was somehow the framework out of which I was living Anyway, he said to pray for the person on the right, and I happened to be on the right of the professor. It was Bob Yarbrough. And when it came his time to pray for me, he simply said one sentence. He said, Dear Lord, please restore to Polly the joy of your salvation. Now, I thought, that wasn't exactly what I asked for. (laughs) I was thinking of, you know, like this prayer, like, oh, help your servant, give her strength, you know. And I thought, oh, well, okay, thanks. Um, (laughs) But it wasn't until my ride home, it was about a 40-minute drive, that it really hit me. What a profound and insightful prayer that was. Somewhere... Along the line, I had subconsciously began to think a lie about Jesus, that he had redeemed me to work me. And in that work, I would find worth. Worth in God's eyes, worth in my eyes, worth in the church's eyes. And I think a little bit, I thought he would love me more the harder I worked for him. Now, the odd thing is, I knew better. I knew I couldn't earn more of God's love. But unfortunately for us all, isn't it true that good theology can be in our head, but not in our hearts? And if we live unchecked, our behavior can preach a different gospel than we know that's true. Why would my children look at my life and want Jesus if all he does is bring you stress? Why would my world look at my life and watch me live this hectic, tired life and understand the truth of a salvation that promises to set you free and give you joy and rest? Dr. Yarber's prayer checked my living theology that night, and I began to reevaluate what it meant to live from the framework of the joy of God's salvation. Now, that's not to say I just added another work on there. Okay, don't be stressful, be joyful, right? And that's not to say that I had no problems anymore. All the stress went away. No, no, not at all. Actually, what I needed was an undergirding joy that would help me meet that pain and the hard times, not ignore it. Right? I saw for the first time that Jesus wanted to redeem the whole of my life. And I saw that I desperately needed his help 
to stop stressing and to begin enjoying his presence. I needed my eyes opened to start seeing him in everything. Keep a Sabbath. Keep a Sabbath. Find ways to keep a Sabbath. The whole world is against the Sabbath. They want you to do things. God doesn't want you to do anything except just be quiet, pay attention, keep a Sabbath. You know, the Sabbath is the most commanded commandment in the whole Bible, and it's the most ignored. Genesis begins, it was evening and there was morning the first day. Those, that sequence, evening and morning. So what happens in the evening? Well, obviously, God's work. You wake up and there it is. Uh, so you, you develop a creative imagination that you are participating in something that started eight hours ago. And now you wake up and you get to be in on it. You're part of it. So if you can get that uh, first chapter of Genesis into your imaginations, it seems to me it saves you from a lot of workaholism, anxiety, uh, manipulation, uh, most of the, most everything that goes wrong in the world goes wrong because of we're not doing it out of a context of God created, God breathed, God called, God said. I live by the faith of the Son of God and His Father. And it's that exchange of his communion with the Father that now becomes the communion with which I commune with Christ, that I'm given resources for that relationship, that friendship, that fellowship, which I don't have in myself. So it's all of grace. So to live in Christ is to live a gracious life. And to live in grace means that you're always living in gratitude. That's, uh, that's how we live. We live with gratitude. And so when I live in gratitude, then we are always seeking to live in his presence. The life God wants me to live and wants you to live is not about stressful labor to earn his pleasure, but it's all about seeing his pleasure in all of life. It's remembering that he is there when we are making dinner as much as he is there when we are reading our Bibles. It's seeing that a smile given to a clerk is a redemptive act. It may have been the only time they were smiled at that day. It's a gift of God through us in the simplest of things. It's understanding that he is engaged with us just as much when we're on our computers as he is when we pray. We must remember this. We must remind ourselves of these things when we feel worthless. Even our routine acts, once we are his children, can be redemptive acts to his world and acts of worship to him. Talk about worth. It's wonderful. When I reminded myself of these truths, it changes everything, especially the hard times. Redemption, though centered on Christ's work on the cross, is not limited in definition by this one wonderful crowning act of God. Anytime 
God is working on behalf of creatures, us, or creation to reverse the effects of the fall, we should name it redemption. It is the continuing work of the Holy Spirit in people's lives and in creation today, and the only reason he was sent when Jesus left. When we influence culture, creation, or each other to be restored and conformed to God's original blueprint, that is a redemptive act, empowered by God, working in tandem with us, his humans. It is indeed a high call and a high privilege to be part of God's redemptive plan, which began before the foundation of the world and will end in the establishment of a new heavens and a new earth. One time I had been given the task to talk on redemptive living, and I didn't quite know what to do with it. Now I was at Regent and passed by Jim Packer in the hallway and thought, oh, I'll just ask him really quick. I'll tell you what he said, but, you know, you understand this is with an East Tennessee accent. It's not going to sound like Jim Packer. But I said, okay, what would you do with this? Where would you go in Scripture with this topic? And he said, oh, redemptive thinking, redemptive thinking. Let me see. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, that was what Jesus was all about, wasn't it? I mean, he went around putting all the bits back together. And that's what we do. We, We go around putting all the bits back together. And I thought... That's it. That's what years steeped in deep theology, very simple, but not simplistic, very profound, putting the bits back together. What a joyful task we have, even when it's hard, and it's hard when a culture doesn't even recognize the bits that need to go back together. But to know that ultimately we are as his ambassadors, putting the bits back together. Now, what gets tough is that we have a lot of people who say, well, that sounds like a really great vision, but I'm in cubicle land. I I don't have this sense that I have all this power to steward to advance the kingdom. But Even folks that don't feel like they have a lot of vocational power probably have more than they realize. So I think it can look as simple as um, making your cubicle in cubicle land beautiful, welcoming, hospitable, um, conducting yourself uh, on the job in a way that is wonderfully teamwork oriented to the extent that you're willing to be someone who readily gives other people credit. All of those things are countercultural ways of of acting uh, in, in the workplace. If the agent of cultural transformation is God, not me or my movement, that is actually amazingly freeing because the reality is we all experience tremendous constraint in what we can do. If, if it's up to me, I am going to be caught up in striving, in anxiety, in stress, in ambition. But if God is at work, if the grace of God is present, even when I fail, even when I mess up, uh, then that actually frees me, I think, to be much more creative, much more fearless. Uh, I'm actually strangely more willing to take risks because it's not up to me to make this succeed. It seems to me that a Christian specialty from the beginning was to lose well. Just think of the story of Jesus. It's a story of uh, him speaking, of course, and being bold, but in a sense losing well. The powers turn against him. He's crucified. And as he's crucified, it's Father, forgive them. And I do think Western Christians need to learn the art of losing well, of not thinking we have to win every argument, win every public debate. That was the story of the first 300 years of Christianity. They were bold, but they were also servants. And when they lost, they lost well. What would the best 
possible promise be? Is it you're going to change the world? Jesus never promises that. Is it you will have a long, fruitful life? Even that is not actually promised. What he does promise is, I will be with you. And so I don't necessarily have success. I don't necessarily have recognition. But I do have joy that nothing can take away. We play out our part in his story by his power, not our own. Without him, the text tells us we can do nothing. But with his indwelling spirit, as Bruce reminded us, uh, we are enabled to step into this wonderful story, to be drawn into that frame that we've been learning about in the now. So we hope this course has restored for you, too, the joy of his salvation by telling once again the story of scripture that draws us to encounter and to understand who Jesus is and who we are as his little people of dust, his image bearers, his kings, his priests, his prophets, to his cosmos, to his world, putting the bits back together. A story that takes us down that same road of Emmaus and brings us back in a genuine response of joy. Interestingly, the whole book of Luke, where we find the story of Emmaus, begins and ends in the same physical place, in the temple. Chapter 1 of Luke, we have Zechariah doing his priestly duty, working hard for God, but with a dim framework of what God can do in his life. For when he gets the message from the angel that the event that he and his wife Elizabeth have waited for so long in their life that should fill them with joy when he gets the news that that's going to happen, he meets it with doubt, which kills joy. That's chapter 1. Chapter 24 is where we find this road to Emmaus and his ascension. And we'll see in that chapter, as they were all looking up and Jesus was taken away from them, it says this, And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple. Blessing God. Jesus had transformed a hidden, frightened group into his ambassadors, filled with joy and confidence. Perhaps it's when God sees our journey into his joy that his deep desire is fulfilled. Perhaps that's what Jesus felt on the road to Emmaus. Perhaps that's what he feels here today as he gives us the framework of his joy. Go enjoy, my brothers and sisters. We have an awesome God. I'm on this journey to, to live out this cultural mandate that God has commanded us to, to walk with. That's an exciting thing to be a part of, but it's humbling and frightening in other ways. Finally, really understanding that my identity is as a child of God, that God loves me as I am. That not only free me, it gave me a, a confidence that I never really have, it's, because it's, no one can take that identity from me. Many people have a perception of Christianity as a no religion. And that's really unfortunate because um, fundamentally, I, I think Christianity is such a huge yes. It's God's yes uh, to flourishing. Because this God, who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who reveals himself finally in Christ, is the God who cares about every square inch of the whole of reality. So he cares about life, and he cares about cities, and he cares about cultures. 
if we reframed our understanding of this big gospel, this, this gospel that isn't just about me going to heaven when I die, but a gospel that accepts me as I am and sends me back into the world with God's power, with God's spirit, with God's people, and I think we will see change. Jesus' parting words to his disciples are, here, you can go, you can make disciples, you can live as I'm telling you to in my teaching, and you can do so because I'm with you. This creator of all things, sustainer of all life, this community of love, of God, Father, God, Son, God, Holy Spirit, this community of love is saying, I'm with you, and that makes you a community of love. Throughout this series, we've been on a journey to discover how the great biblical story shapes and reframes our lives and the world around us. And we've discovered that however big this story is, there's no getting away from the personal challenge to each one of us. Where has your heart burned as we've journeyed through Reframe? What has God opened your eyes to see? And what is God saying to you and to your community about how you can be ambassadors to your world today? As your journey with Christ continues, our hope is that you will see Him as the one in whom all things hold together.